Good evening and welcome to the Carnegie Town Hall. This meeting of the Sioux Falls City Council will begin in a few moments. The City Council meets on the first, second, and third Tuesday of each month at 7 o'clock p.m. and serves as the City's policy-making and legislative body. Each meeting is governed by Robert's Rules of Order unless those guidelines conflict with City Ordinance or Charter. City Council meetings offer an opportunity for citizens to speak directly to their elected representatives. Those in attendance are invited to address the Council during the public input segment at the beginning of the agenda. At that time, any issue that is not subject to formal action later in the agenda can be addressed. Testimony that concerns a resolution or an ordinance's second reading is only allowed when those specific agenda items are being addressed by the Council. When addressing the Council, citizens should speak directly into the microphones at the podium and state their names for the record after being recognized by the Chair. To accommodate and respect all viewpoints, citizen comments are limited by ordinance to no more than five minutes each. Comments should be respectful and focused on providing new information that will benefit the Council's deliberative process. The Chair reserves the right to limit the number of speakers. City Council meetings are broadcast live on CityLink and online at www.siouxfalls.org. Information regarding the City Council, its committees, meetings, briefings, and members is available by visiting www.siouxfalls.org slash council or by calling the council office at 605-367-8085. Thank you for your interest in Sioux Falls City Government. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, Carnegie Hall. Uh, today is Tuesday, October 7th, and this is the Sioux Falls City Council meeting. Uh, we'll start our meeting with a roll call of your city council. Council members Kylie. Here. Rolfing. Here. Staggers. Present. Anderson. Here. Erickson. Here. Erpenbach. Here. Jamison. Karski. Here. We are very blessed tonight uh, to have a Pastor Bob Chell uh, with us. Uh, pastor has got a uh, unique journey. Uh, he was a pastor at South Dakota State University for a number of years, and uh, he was called to do something a little different. And now he's at uh, St. Dismas Lutheran ch uh, uh, Chapel, and that just happens to be at the South Dakota State Penitentiary uh, up on the hill here in Sioux Falls. Um, pastor, it's, it's great to have you here. And uh, Pastor will lead us with our invocation, uh, we'd ask you to stand and then remain standing for our Pledge of Allegiance after the pastor is finished. Uh, pastor Bob, welcome. Thank you. Uh, as Mayor Huther said, I spent the majority of my uh, uh, ministry as a campus pastor where there was a, uh, an expression on campus, the fights are so vicious because the stakes are so small. And, uh, um, and there's some truth in that when there's scarce resources, the competition gets even rougher. And uh, moving to St. Dismas, I found that's even more the case, where, where small things uh, mean a great deal. One of the role of, of, of clergy of, of any denomination or any faith, I think, is to speak the truth to power. And uh, I guess the truth that I want to speak is that uh, we most often, all of us here, think that uh, our problem is scarcity, when in fact, I think most often, our problem is abundance. Uh, the truth is we have all been richly blessed. We all ate today and we're going to eat tomorrow. <laughs> we're going to sleep in warm beds. That's not true of everybody in our community. Another part of the responsibility of, of the council members is to uh, uh, speak for those who don't have a seat at the table, uh, those who do not have access to power. And for most of us, that was our own families just a generation or two generations ago. But whether someone is new to this country and new to this community or whether their forebearers welcomed our own forebearers when they came to this country as immigrants, uh, uh, we need to be mindful of those who don't have the abundance that we enjoy. Please join me in prayer. 
Create of all that lives and moves. Keep us mindful of all our blessings. We give thanks for those who have gone before us, for the faith and values that they lived and modeled for us. Help us to live with integrity and to honor them and you by our care for all that you have created. Focus our vision that we might see the plight of those who are overlooked. Sharpen our hearing that we may listen to the voice of those who yearn for hope and opportunity. Guide and shape our listening and speaking that the decisions made this evening will enrich the lives of all those who are a part of our community. Amen. To the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Well, again, good evening, everybody. It's, it's so nice to have you here. We appreciate it. Uh, I do have a proclamation to read, and Colleen, would you want to come forward? Lacey. Very good. And Lacey, will you join us as well? Thank you, Lacey. Uh, to Lacey and Colleen, I'm, I'll read a proclamation on, on behalf. Uh, Whereas the Congress, by joint resolution, has designated October of each year as National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Whereas... The purpose of this month is to celebrate the many and varied contributions of America's workers with disabilities and educate the public about disability employment issues. Whereas approximately 15% of the city's population has disabilities and each is a family member, friend, neighbor, employee, and customer. Whereas all persons with disabilities have the right and responsibility to be active, contributing members of society. Whereas, workplaces that welcome the talents of all people, including people with disabilities, are a crucial part of our efforts to build an inclusive community and, yes, a strong economy. Now, therefore, I, Mike Cuther, Mayor of the City of Sioux Falls, do hereby proclaim October 2014 as Disability Employment Awareness Month in Sioux Falls and encourage all residents, businesses, organizations, and government agencies to observe this month by bringing down barriers and by supporting initiatives and activities that support and promote providing employment opportunities for people with disabilities. Colleen, Lacey, thank you for being here tonight and thank you all. Council will now move on to our consent agenda. Any uh, motions or changes to our consent agenda? Move to approve, Erpenbach. Second, Anderson. Councilor Erpenbach, uh, we'd like to uh, approve this consent agenda, seconded by Councilor Anderson, Jr. If there's no discussion, a roll call vote, please. Council members Kiley? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Karski? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0. <laughs> Thank you. We'll now move on to our regular agenda. Uh, any motions or changes to that, Council? Move for approval, Anderson. Second, Karski. Councilor Anderson, Jr. has made a motion to approve uh, tonight's agenda, seconded by Councilor Karski. If no discussion, a roll call vote, please. Council members Kiley? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Karski? Yes. That is also, also passed, 7 to 0. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, welcome to tonight's meeting. We've got a, a really good crowd uh, and, and appreciate that. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to actually engage the council on any topic that you want involving your city. Uh, all we'd ask, just come forward, state your name, uh, and then if you could keep your comments to five minutes or less, we'd appreciate that as well. But welcome. Uh, Scott Erisman, Sioux Falls. Start out on a couple positive notes. Uh, 
My good friend Teresa Staley won the uh, Spirit of the Dakota Award on Saturday. Uh, there was 13 nominations, um, and uh, it was a great thing. Um, her nominating uh, talked about Snow Gates and Drake Springs Pool and her work with uh, being a piano teacher and helping a lot of people in the community, and it was it was wonderful. And um, Kermit told me that you guys are going to recognize her next Tuesday, so that's great. Uh, on another positive note, I watched the informational meeting, and I couldn't agree more with something uh, Kenny said about the uh, smoke detector program. I think it is money very well spent, and it is a great program. Uh, ironically, I tested all mine yesterday, <laughs> so when I watched this today, I thought that was pretty cool. And like Kenny said, if there's just one life saved because of it, it's, it's well worth its cost. So it's a great program. I hope they continue and keep doing it. I wanted to talk a little bit about my uh, visits to the event center. I um, went there for the Friday night grand opening and I also went there for Joan Jett. Um, customer service was great. Uh, but I was a little disheartened by the fact that I paid with a debit card and the bartender didn't give me the, the slip back to give him a tip and I asked him about that and he said, we're not allowed to. And I said, you know, he said, we're willing, we can accept tips, but we cannot write a, you can't write a tip on the, on, the, on the slip. And then I talked to, that was the liquor bar, and then I talked to the beer tenders, and they said they were not allowed to put out a jar. Same thing, they can take tips, but they're not allowed to encourage it. Um, and I said, well, why, why is this? And they said, well, management SMG told them that it was against uh, city rules, that it was a uh, city, city, city rules that since it was a city owned building that they were not allowed to put a tip jar out. Now, <laughs> I'm hard pressed to find a city ordinance that says you can't put a tip jar, out, tip jar out in a city owned building. So I'm not sure who in SMG told them this, this, but the thing that bothers me the most about it is we just spent a half a million dollars on workforce development and in a city owned building where we're contracted with a contractor to employ people and to work in the event center, we, we can't encourage tipping them? It, it, it baffles my mind. And I don't know who to talk to about it or at SMG, but it seems kind of strange that we all this money and economic development that the event center is going to bring in, but we're not allowed to, to give a tip on a credit card slip at the, at the event center? I, I was very disheartened by that. So... I'm here to say something about it as someone who's worked in hospitality on and off for over 20 years. Uh, people who work in hospitality get paid very low wages, hourly low wages. They very much de depend on gratuity, very much. It's state law, they can't, you know, they don't have to pay them more than $2 an hour, so two thirteen an hour. So I hope someone looks into this and makes sure that they can put those tip jars out and we can give them tips on their credit card slips. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it. Welcome. Good evening, Council Mayor. I.L. Weiderman from Sioux Falls. <clears throat> uh, I find it ironic that uh, you have a proclamation this evening pertaining to uh, this job for disabilities, but yet you take the money away from paratransit. I find that just very disheartening. Uh, you'll find a few of us here in the stripes. That's because of solidarity um, on this uh, enforcement of certain items with the city. Uh, city uh, attorney is here representing the city um, at a trial where they brought criminal charges against a civil matter and thank heavens Joni Cutler, Judge Joni Cutler had them all dismissed, not guilty, except the one the city asked to have dismissed. Um, there's something coming up that I don't understand. Um, it's building permits, doing away with building permits. That is just unheard of. Every city I, I've ever been in all over the United States has building permits, and now you have it on next week's agenda, I guess, to do away with them. Why? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Weiderman. Appreciate that. Um, did anybody else want to? Welcome. Nice to have you here. <laughs> thank you. Adam Buss, uh, Sioux Falls. 
I'd like to draw your attention to an uh, ordinance that I was in violation of is 160.553, which is removing my truck from my residential property. And I think this, this is a zoning issue, of course, that I am currently going through. Um, I think that because it's my personal property, I shouldn't be hardshipped with having to find a parking area outside of a residence for my service or commercial vehicle. I guess uh, I was called in anonymously, and so I don't get to discuss that with the person. It probably wasn't even a neighbor. I've spoken with my neighbors about this issue, and that, that at least nobody's fessed up to, we don't like your truck here, which is okay. I mean, bring it to my attention, but it doesn't devalue any neighbor's properties. Nobody's gotten hurt. Zero fatalities from having my truck parked in my driveway. It's a third stall, and so it just sits on a cement pad. Along with that, the ordinance itself is a bit uh, wide, which it extends it to commercial and service vehicles. And I've gotten many different definitions from depending on who you speak with. There's not a particular definition out there, but the widest ones that I've gotten is anything that alters your vehicle to make it a commercial or service vehicle. So I want to draw your attention to that could be anything that you write off your commercial vehicle from. So you got to think about Frisbee's plumbers who put their ladder on their truck. Those people are in violation. Anybody that sells Mary Kay, your car's pink, you've altered it. You're in violation of this. At some point, the neighbor's going to call you in. And so I think that this speaks to a greater problem is that Entrepreneurs have a tough time the way it is, like myself. And so having my truck on my, I, I can't afford 1200 bucks for a commercial parking space out on the edge of town where I have to go drive out and uh, use my truck when I can. So I think that should change. Uh, the enforcement part of it, just being, having an anonymous person just come and just say, I don't, I don't like that. Well, you know, when have you ever had an anonymous tip, I guess, get you. That doesn't really work in the crime area. Along with that, um, you know, you could have, use it as a bargaining chip against somebody to say, hey, I know you're sitting on your work truck there on your driveway, and if you don't come mow my lawn on Friday, I'm going to call you in. And so, I mean, there's any reason that somebody wants to say, I don't agree with this, I'm going to go ahead and call you in, and now you have to face this hardship of parking somewhere else, your work truck. Thank you. Adam, thank you very much. Appreciate you coming in. Thanks. Welcome. Evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, my concern is for drivers without insurance. Just uh, introduce yourself to the oh, people of Sioux Falls. Rick Albright from Sioux Falls. Thank you, Rick. Concern is drivers without insurance. Uh, in, the pa in the recent past, I've had four accidents, none of which were my fault. Three of them were hit and runs. Two of them had phony plates on the cars. Two and possibly three were without insurance, and one individual provided phony insurance information to the police officer in that he did not have insurance but gave them a uh, policy number and an uh, organization. As a result, I've got the privilege of paying my deductible and hope that I can get it reimbursed. And after the second accident, most insurance companies will either raise your rates or wipe out any discounts, even though none of those accidents were my fault. Uh, I would encourage the council in conjunction with the police department to conduct an unannounced month-long spot check for just licenses and proof of insurance. And that violators then have their individual photos and the violations posted in the local newspaper because an announcement itself saying that this is going to be conducted will not deter anyone. However, humiliation may deter second-time offenders. Thank you. And thank you, Rick. Appreciate that. Folks, did anybody else want to engage the council? Welcome. Robert Colby, Mr. Mayor, Council. Now that the budgets for the city and the county have to, if they haven't already been submitted, they will be shortly. And sometimes it's uh, good to go and recap some of the things that we have to deal with in both those entities. Where would the city be without property tax? Good question. Now, I, the county, as you are well aware, they get property tax at the same rate, that the, about the same rate that the city does. 50% of the county's budget is property tax money. The unfortunate thing is 51% of the county's budget 
is law enforcement. So all of the rest of the budget for the county has to come from uh, state and federal monies and uh, fees and services that they charge. Now, that's outside money. I know the city gets outside money besides the property tax also. Sales tax has been something that has made the city what it is today. But with law enforcement, you must remember that the county is the state's law enforcement arm. The state has really very small law enforcement. They have DCI and they have the highway patrol, but they really don't have a law enforcement arm. That's the county sheriff and all of that goes with that. And 80% of all the problems that the county has to deal with as far as law enforcement and also the city come from either alcohol or drugs. Now the city says, well, we don't get any of the money from alcohol. Well, let me give you a little brief background. The feds get their money from the point of origin. They get their tax money. The state gets money pre-sale. The state gets four cents for every dollar of sale of alcoholic beverages, and the city gets its two cents on sales tax. So you do get a benefit from sales tax as per alcohol, but what does the county get? The county gets to arrest, they get to defend, they get to prosecute, they get to adjudicate, they get to imprison, and with a little luck, they also get to take care of the welfare of the individuals that may wind up in the system. Now, that doesn't mean that the city doesn't have some problems with this, but the lion's share of that falls under the county. <clears throat> now, you must remember that the city is the only jurisdiction, the only political jurisdiction in the United States that grows at will. States don't grow except Hawaii, and that's got a new little island coming up shortly. Other than that, all the other states don't grow. All counties can't grow unless it's an, a joint effort. If Lincoln and Minneapolis County wanted to get together, they'd have to both agree to do it. One can't do it without the other, but the city can grow at will. So therefore, the city also has a chance to get more property tax because when that portion of what was part of a county, Lincoln or Minnehaha, comes into the city, the property tax on those structures then comes to the city's coffers as well as the, the county already has been getting monies for that from property tax. Now I'm grateful that the mayor made the comments that when he was up in the oil fields that they, counties do need something in order to grow. The reason I say uh, you don't know how much um, county commissioners around the state appreciate that comment because it's not been something that's been readily held by some of the city councilors and or legislators. Uh, there was a legislator we went to who used to be a city councilor and we're trying to get some, uh, how would I say, get some assistance from the state and that particular legislature, legislator said, all you county commissioners ever do is whine. It's interesting because that person's now a county commissioner. Now, we would like, we, I'm speaking as a former county commissioner, sales tax would aid and abet the counties because that's the only growing portion of some income that would help to make the counties meet the obligations that they have. You know, deferred maintenance is not maintenance. And many of the counties in the state, whether it's Minnehaha or Lincoln, have to deal with that sort of thing. Now, if the county does not have a sustainable income other than the property tax, you are going to have the growth city that has benefit, benefited from sales tax and doing all of its things, and the county around it can't meet its obligations, then you are going to have a, a have and have not situation, which is one of those things that the city and the county really are joint rails on the track leading into the future. We've had too many times that we've had mayors that thought that the counties were not worth supporting. We've had those that didn't care for counties just because they just didn't care. The area of growth will only continue to grow as Sioux Falls has grown and as the county grows if there is a sustainable income for the counties. They can't exist on property tax alone, and the state 
in its infinite wisdom, has capped property taxes, which means that they say counties don't know how to budget and don't know how to live on the income that they get from property tax. <coughs> so with your support, and I'm speaking for myself as a former has-been, no, I'm former and still a has-been, anyhow, we need to do something to make counties grow at the same rate, because if the counties aren't going to grow, and if the two counties around you are not growing with their budgets, then the city is going to be handling a lot more problems than they really want. Thank you. Commissioner Colby, thank you. Welcome. <clears throat> Good evening, City Council and Mr. Mayor. Rich McCorris from Sioux Falls. Uh, this evening, and my goal is not to uh, point a finger at the City Council or say you have done nothing wrong. My emotion and passion may get the best of me, but my intention this evening is not to criticize, but to try and uplift our thinking. About 12 years ago, I was at college at the University of Sioux Falls, sitting in my dorm room on a Saturday night, studying math and watching reruns of city council meetings. I know that's a problem, but that's a different issue. Thing, as I was watching the city council that evening, a young girl stood up to the podium, got in front and said to the city council multiple times, you have to do something, you have to do something. It really grabbed my attention as I listened to this young girl talk. She shared the story of how she picked up a young elementary age boy by the prison who didn't have shoes and smelt like urine. Who would have thought that that one city council meeting would change my life forever? It set me on a path of entering into a new career field and trying to pursue a ministry and a service to alleviating poverty in our city. And uh, I didn't know the reality of the problem until I got more involved. About four years ago, I was heavily involved with the Sioux Falls Furniture Mission delivering furniture in Sioux Falls. Saturday morning, we dropped off some furniture, left it there. The odd thing this time, there was no parents home, just young children, all under the age 10, alone. I left not feeling so well, and I decided to return a couple of days later, take a chance. So I took a couple of bags of groceries with me and returned to that home. When I returned, the mother was home, and we tried to have a conversation. She didn't speak very good English. As we talked, it became evident that there were serious struggles in this family. I was trying to be gentle and listen to her, and I kept trying to understand, what is your job? What is your job? After much conversation, the only word she could really make out at the end is, sell myself sell myself. Prostitution. My first thought was, how dirty? How could someone do this? But then I had kids, and I realized I would do the exact same thing if I had to put food on the table for my kids. Fast forward two weeks ago, I've been going door to door in a neighborhood where our church is mo moving into, down by the old Horner Lumber Yard, kind of a rough neighborhood area. As I visited homes, I came upon a door. A young boy came to the door, eight years old. I said, mom and dad home. No mom and dad home. A little three or four year old came kind of waddling out behind him. I left the gift that I had brought that evening, came back two days later and the mom was home. We started to converse and I almost started to have nightmares of the same vision as before. As we conversed, she said she's a delivery person. I thought to myself, pizza delivery, what else do you deliver? We tried to talk further and I realized she doesn't have a driver's license. How do you deliver pizza? Ends up, she's not delivering pizza, she's delivering drugs on foot. In non-politically correct terms, she's a drug mule. We have an overwhelmingly generous city, as evidenced by the strength of the annual United Way campaign, numerous service agencies in town, and the strong support for youth supports. However, we've got a serious problem. We're basically putting a Band-Aid on a bulging wound. I look at it this way. Our basement is flooding. We're calling all of our neighbors over. The neighbors are showing up and helping, but nobody seems to be looking at the window well where the water is coming in. This evening, I would ask that the city council take action at some point in the near future to stop being on the defensive in the prevent mode because our prevent mode is basically preventing nothing. It's time for us to go on the offensive. I would ask that the Sioux Falls City Council consider establishing a task force, a high priority task force with it to develop a strategic plan to eradicate poverty in the city of Sioux Falls over the next 15 years. I would recommend a four prong approach, business, nonprofit, city and county. Each entity puts in $25,000 to develop a strategic plan over the next year. 
Sioux Falls Tomorrow has laid out some fabulous goals and has laid out some great items for us to pursue. The community development staff has done a great job of putting together action plans around affordable housing with a great amount of information. Mayor Munson's task force in 2004 laid a great foundation to fight homelessness and some great things have come, for it, come from it. But yet enough still has not been done. I'm not here to convince you tonight that we have a problem. I would hope that you are already aware that we have a problem. Just visit with your local county and school officials. There's too much at stake for us not to put our best and our brightest together in the same room. And I don't make this next comment as a criticism at all. I look at the event center as a great asset to our city. We tackled something and we got it done. I would say we got it done because we put our best and our brightest in the room and we had a group that was at the forefront reporting to the city council. I'm asking that we do the same for a strategic plan to eradicate poverty in our city. There's too much opportunity to capture. This is the greatest economic development opportunity for our city today. Eradicate poverty and the dollars will flow in. It's just not a humanitarian effort. Our pocketbooks will benefit as well and that should get your attention. There are kids in our city tonight who will know no different unless we go on the offensive. Tonight, between Cliff Avenue and Minnesota, and somewhere between 17th Street and Russell, drugs are being delivered on foot. Two young boys wait at home, not watching an iPad like my daughter tonight, but sitting at home waiting for their mom to return. Mr. Mayor and City Council, I don't point the finger at you. I point the finger at you and I and the rest of our city. And I ask that we would join together and put our best and brightest together. Let's do the unthinkable. Let's dream big. Let's eradicate poverty in the city of Sioux Falls. I thank you for your time and I look forward to future conversation. Thank you, Rich. Very good job. Folks, would anybody else want to engage the council? Well, thank you all. It was great testimony. We appreciate it, and I know the council appreciates it as well. Item number 25. Item 25 is transfer of a 2014-15 package malt beverage license from Maria Luz Lima, La Michoacana, Mexican store, 2319 West 12th Street, to Luis Guerran, Tienda El Quetzal, 2319 West 12th Street, CUP not required. Item 26 is a new 2014-15 package malt beverage license for WAM LLC All Day Cafe Tap House 41, 2101 West 41st Street, Suite 24, CUP not required. Jamie? Good evening, Jamie Palmer with licensing. Item 25 is a transfer um, from a mother to her son. The day-to-day -day operations of the business will not change. Um, item 26, they currently hold a retail liquor license, but they wish to sell um, growlers, and so they will need a packaged malt beverage license in order to do that. So Thank you, I will answer any questions you have. Council. Move to approve, Karski. <coughs> Second, Rolfing. Thank you. Councilor Karski has made a motion to approve these items. Seconded by Councilor Rolfing. A roll call vote, please. Council members Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Erickson? Erpenbach? Yes. Karski? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0. Item 27. Item 27 is a second reading. An ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property at 201 South Franklin Avenue from the I-2 Heavy Industrial District to the C-2 Commercial Neighborhood and Streetcar District, petition number 2014-83 and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. Uh, Jason Bieber with planning staff. Oh, looks like our little thing's not working here, so I'll try and go through this. Um, this is an application by Raymond Duval, and the owner is Greg Rubin. It is located at uh, 201 South Franklin Avenue, uh, which is uh, just over the viaduct on East 11th Street. Uh, the parcel is little, little over one acre in size, and the purpose of it is to uh, continue to utilize the site for motor vehicle sales. Uh, Planning Commission does recommend approval of this application. Jason, thank you. This is a second reading, folks. Did anybody want to engage the council on this topic? Thank you, council. Move for approval, Anderson. Second, Karski. Councilor Anderson Jr. has made a motion to approve this item. Seconded by Councilor Karski. If there's no discussion on roll call vote, please. 
Council members Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Karski? Yes. That is passed seven to zero. Thank you. Item 28. Item 28 is the second reading. An ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property at 2525 West 3rd Street from the C2 Commercial Neighborhood and Streetcar District to the I-1 Light Industrial District, petition number 2014-84 and amending the official zoning map of the city of Sioux Falls. The Planning Commission recommends approval. Uh, Jason Bieber with Planning and Building Services. Uh, this is an application by Scott Schmidt, and the owner of the property is Andrew Hansen. Uh, it is located on 2525 West 3rd Street, which is one parcel east of North Kiwanis Avenue. Uh, the size is roughly 0.42 acres, and the, the purpose of the application is to construct a warehouse for the first national pond um, for most of their stuff before it gets transferred to their retail stores. Um, since this proposed warehouse use will be adjacent to uh, single family residential uses, a level C buffer yard will be required on the north and east side and that is indicated in the green. Um, a level C buffer yard does require that 30 foot setback with a four foot high berm and four units, or excuse me, 40 units of landscaping for every 100 lineal feet. And the Planning Commission does recommend approval of this application. Jason, thank you. Uh, again, second reading. Did anybody want to engage the council on this topic? Council? Uh, Councilor Anderson Jr. We have any uh, response from the neighborhood? Uh, we have not heard anything from the neighbors. The notices were sent for Planning Commission. No calls or move for approval. Thank you, Councillor. Second, Rolfing. Councillor Rolfing, thank you as well. It's been a motion and it has been seconded. A roll call vote, please. Council members Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Karski? Yes. Thank you. That is passed seven to zero. Item 29. Item 29 is a second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property at South Dakota Highway 42 and East 6 Mile Road from the RA1 Apartment Residential Low Density District to the RA3 Apartment Residential High Density District, petition number 2014-89, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. Uh, Jason Bieber, Planning and Building Services. Uh, this is an application from Erica Beck for Lloyd Companies. Uh, the owner is Tom Walsh. Uh, it is located at the Willow Run Golf Course. Um, the size is roughly 2.4 acres. Uh, the purpose is to add additional, uh, additional land zoned RA3 to construct the proposed uh, apartment complex and new clubhouse area. During final design, they found that there was, it was gonna be a little bit bigger than they initially intended, so they need to add a little bit of acreage of RA3 there. Jason, thank you. Folks, second reading, anybody interested? Council? Move for approval, Anderson. Second, Kylie. Thank you, Councilor Anderson, Jr. Thank you, Councilor Kylie. Has been um, made a motion to approve and seconded. Uh, roll call, please. Council members Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Mm. Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Karski? Yes. That is passed seven to zero. Thank you. Item 30. Item 30 is a second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the 2013 Shape Places Zoning Ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. Uh, Jason Bieber again with Planning and Building Services. Uh, planning and zoning staff have identified several sections of the current shape places zoning ordinance that need corrections and edits to be implemented correctly. Some of the proposed amendments are as follows. Uh, the first is the MDM, MD3 form is not allowed in the live work district. Uh, this was shown correctly in the interface that I believe you guys have a copy of. However, is incorrectly shown in the actual text of the zoning ordinance. Um, next one, we are adding N in the NF1 form, we we, uh, the buffer yard for the NF1 form for churches is indicated correctly in the um, table for buffer yards as a level B. However, the text indicated a level A, so we are correcting the text to indicate the level B buffer yard. Uh, daycare centers were also added as an accessory use in to a place of worship in the NF1 form. We found that several churches have daycares. They just kind of go along together. So we've added that as an accessory use to a church. Uh, we also identified assisted living facilities should be added to the BCF3 form. This is the largest form that allows hospitals, um, research facilities, uh, recreation facilities. So we figured assisted living would be a good addition to this. And this kind of all stemmed from the touch mark rezoning there on Phillips and 18th Street. 
Um, we've also moved the definition of greenways and highways um, from, the, from within the buffer yard section to the actual definition section at the beginning of the ordinance. And there's also an inclusion of three diagrams on how to measure the side height that's lo located on the left, the sign area on the right, and then how to measure if it's a one or two face sign down below. Jason, thanks for the summary. Appreciate it. Uh, folks, any comments on this? Very good. Councilor Anderson, Jr. The assisted living, is that any size assisted living facility? The assisted lit Smaller ones that are dotted out throughout the, the city. Yep. The, we are adding the assisted living to the BCF3 form to allow some of these larger ones like Trail Ridge and some of them. Um, the NF2 form where they were actually allowed, only allowed like a two-story building, and we found that there's several of these that are a lot larger than that. So we needed to the, allow them in a, a form that allows bigger. Okay, so there, it doesn't affect the smaller ones. No, then. no, those are still allowed. We just kind of needed some way to address some of these bigger ones, like the touch mark that's three, four stories tall. It just, there was nothing in the ordinance to address them. Thank you. I'll move approval. Thank you, Councilor Rolfing. Thank you, Councilor Anderson, oh. Jr. Uh, there's been a motion and it has been seconded, but a question by Councilor Erickson. I got a, qu a couple questions here. One, um, for these changes, is that going to, is that just basically fixing what's there or is it going to make any changes for um, any other development or other changes that we'll have to rezone or do anything like that? Uh, no, most of these were kind of just basic wording changes and then some of the other ones that we've added uses were just on some of the issues we had found going through plan reviews from April till today. Um, just more of the basic ones. We have other lists that we are looking to, to do another list, you know, at the beginning of the year that'll probably get into more of the more difficult decisions, I guess. These are kind of... Small follow-up. With the daycare uh, centers being an accessory in the churches, um, my question, I don't know if this is a... I don't know, wade through it and answer my question best you can, I guess. Um, churches are um, an allowable um, development in residential neighborhoods. And to allow some of these really large daycares in a church in a residential neighborhood might not always be the best idea. So is that something that will need approval to allow the churches, say a new church goes in, they decide to have a giant daycare in their church facility at the same time. Is that something that needs an additional approval with planning and the city council or how does that work? This would, be just, this would just be strictly an accessory use. Now we added some things in, some conditions for the accessory use that they, nest, they need to be subordinate in size to the church. Okay. So we can't have a daycare take over the entire church and then have a little tiny area of the church. So most of these will be kind of small daycares within the church, but they won't need other approval if they can meet those couple of conditions that we added. Thanks. Jason and Councilor Erickson is a question though. Will there ever be a, a, a situation where a daycare within a church in a neighborhood would, ha would have to come to the council for approval? Not unless it was a non-conforming use and he needed to rezone it, so. Thank you, Councilor, did that answer your question? Very good, thank you. Well, very good, they're a good discussion. Uh, yes, Councilor Rolfing. Councilor Erickson, you seem to have some problems with this and I can see the, the thought going through your head that says, you know, I'm gonna uh, we're going to fund our church with the daycare, and the daycare is uh, three times the facility, and the and the church is a smaller one. Um, I, I'm wondering if we need to do something because that's not what well, that's not what this is intended to do. Correct, right. Jason? No, this is intended to to allow these smaller daycares that are within these churches. It seems like that's one of the main things churches are going to. They want to allow these small daycares. Well, I'm wondering if we should. Um, if an amendment to this might be a size wise or something like that, however we do it. These are the things we're gonna run into with shape mm -hmm. places. There's no, and, and you caught something, go ahead, I'm this, sorry. This is where it came from too, is I received a phone call today from um, being at large. I had a constituent call and said, we just built a brand new house, there's a church going in. Um, I said, well, what color is it on your map? And we walked through what allowable, and I learned along with her what the allowable, um, things could go there and schools, churches are certainly something that are allowable in this residential neighborhood. Now, and I explained that and this constituent then is completely fine with it. However, if there was a big daycare, because a church is much different than a daycare, a church generally has um, activity a lot on Sunday 
and some other times during the day, but nothing like, um, you know, like on a Sunday where you might have a thousand people coming in. Now, if you have a daycare with 100 kids, 200 kids, that traffic is much different again for these residential neighborhoods. And I don't know that they would be okay with that instance. That's where my concern is. That's where I'm a little bit uneasy with just adding that as an accessory idea and just saying, good to go, have a daycare, because that's not necessarily supportive in every neighborhood if you're I would like to um, uh, <clears throat> suggest I guess or uh, yeah suggest that uh, we put this off for for a week and ask you to come back uh, the second reading to uh, come back with some some other ways that we can work work with Councilor Erickson and myself if you will and uh, come back with something that might fit that unless somebody else has this a better is the idea. second reading you're on the second reading you made but we can postpone this Second reading until next week, can't we? Motion. <coughs> Is that a motion, Council? That's a motion. So there's been a motion to uh, delay the the second reading, second reading vote until, until next week. Fourteenth. In Councilor Erickson, is that okay? Uh, there's any. Does that make sense? Motion to defer second reading. Motion to defer second reading for a week, Paul. Does that sound right? Yes. yes. Very good. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councilor Karski. We had a first motion. Do we have to do anything with that first motion? This is a substitute motion. Substitute he just motion. didn't say that word. I didn't say substitute, is. but I did now. Okay. Thank you, Councilor. <laughs> Very good. Uh, so there's been a motion to defer the second reading of the, um, of the items that Jason's discussed tonight to next week. It has been seconded. Any discussion? A roll call vote, please. Council members Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? No. Karski? No. Uh, that is passed five to two. Item 31. Item 31 is a first reading to set a date of hearing and second reading for Tuesday, October 14th, 2014 at 7 o'clock p.m. for an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, providing supplemental appropriations, City Council, City Clerk, $110,000. Welcome, Lori. Thank you, Lori Hogstead, City Clerk. Um, the first reading that Tamara just read is for a transfer of $110,000 um, from our budget to the City Clerk City Council budget, and this is for the DS850. Um, it sounds like a fancy sports car, but it's actually a really cool voting machine. Um, and this machine will um, scan and tabulate the uh, ballots from our election. And I'm going to share a few features with you, and I think once you hear a little bit about this machine, you'll be sold on it as well. And I have a little picture of it there, so as I'm talking about it, you can see, see what I'm talking about. The first thing, and if this was all it did, it would probably sell me, but it will count 300 ballots per minute. The model that we currently have been using and that we used in April counted um, 120 ballots per minute. So if we took our, say, 32,000 votes, ballots that we had in our last election, rounded up, and we ran them just straight through without any glitches, any problems in our old machines, um, it would take about four and a half hours. And we know that isn't at all what happened. But, um, but if we take those same 32,000 and run those through this DS850, they would go through in 1.7 hours. Um, so a huge difference. So that's one, um, one great thing about this machine. Another one is it will read the front and back of the ballots at the same time, which is really great for us because we did have a very large ballot that was on the front and the back, and it's able to read and scan those votes from both sides at the same time. Um, it can also read any orientation. If for some reason we have a, a jammed ballot or a ballot that we need to run back through and it's folded, and the first time we run it through, you know, the normal way, we can say, oh, let's flip it upside down and run it through backwards, see if that works better. So we're able to do that with, with the ballot machines as well. Um, there's, there's 15 sensors along the ballot track. You can, you can kind of see the S shape of the track up there, and that helps guide the ballots through. And really, to watch that in action, I tried to get a video of it, but it was too large of a file, so I couldn't do it, but it's just, it just flies through there. It's, it's great. 
Um, continuing on a few more things. This will also sort into three output trays. The bottom tray that we'll go into are those ballots that have been counted, there's no issues with. The middle tray we will not use because that's for write-in ballots and we do not allow that in our state, but some states do. Um, and the top tray is for those that require further review. But the really great thing about this one, it does not stop the whole process. Before, if you had one ballot where instead of filling in the oval, they put an X, everything would come to a halt. You'd have to stop the whole process, take the one ballot, go get it checked, and start them all over again. Instead, it will place them in this separate top tray and everything continues going on. In the meantime, you can be checking on those, um, taking those to the resolution board, having those uh, fixed or, um, or tick, they're not fixed, taking a look at, run those back through the machine. That's not a good word to use, is it? Um, but anyway, so um, that's really nice because it won't stop the entire process. And then also folded ballots. We had a terrible time with absentee ballots. In fact, I think it was about I don't know, it must have been about 11 or 12 last time midnight that we started running through absentee and it was, it was torture just to watch those. I mean, a few would run through and it would stop. A few more and it would stop. And this new um, 850 machine, it's just slick the way it runs. We, our trainer, I went to some training a couple weeks ago, she purposefully was jamming ballots, which you, know, you never want to see anybody do that, but she purposely jammed them, pulled them out, they were all bent up, put them back in, they ran right through. And so I think that will really help us um, when we count those absentee ballots. And oh, I already mentioned the, the transporter that takes the ballots through. And what we would like to do is um, we will have two machines versus four. And the county is going to purchase one and this money would allow us to purchase the second machine. And in fact, um, County Auditor Litz feels that even if our population increased by 30,000, that these uh, machines, two machines, would have the capacity to count votes on election night. So that's good. Um, there's a 15-inch LCD screen on the machine and tons of reports we can print out. We went through the whole process when I went through the training and uh, it, it'll be great with all the different reports we can get. And also there's, a, there's security safeguards of course, nothing is perfect as we, as we know in the world of security, but there's a number of security safeguards and it seems like every time you need to do something, you have to enter a password, which is fine because that way you're continually entering the password, different passwords, you know that you're authorized to be operating that machine. Um, so I just have a big picture up there where you can see um, the, the screen and then the ballots are fed in through the top and they follow that S curve around and they drop into the trays. and the um, county will be using both of these machines on November 4th, and so if you have a chance to go down and see them, um, that would be great. I know that they would love to show them off, um, and I plan to go down and just watch how everything goes that evening as well. Um, a few more items to mention, besides just the, the benefits of this machine, um, as far as our collaboration with the county, is that the county this morning um, did pass an addendum to the agreement with the city saying that um, you know they will take care of, of the maintenance, the ownership and operation of the machines. Once we purchase it, that's the end of our commitment for the cost um, and it will, uh, the rest will be maintained by the county. Um, there's so many good things about it. I think I've shared a lot, but um, I would ask for your uh, motion to place this for second reading next week. Lori, thank you. Great detail. Yes. And your words are fine. <laughs> yes, Councillor Staggers. Yes, uh, Lori, um, we don't have any obligation to buy this. Am I correct? We're just doing this as a favor for you the county? You know what? We do not have an obligation to buy it. I don't know that I would call it a favor. I would call it collaboration because on election night for us, and not only election night, but throughout our election process, the county helps us a great deal, um, helps me a great deal. And on election night, they actually count all of our ballots down there. They have all the staff to do it. Their staff is trained on the machines. Um, they print out the reports. It's just, it's really a great process that we work with through the county. Not only that, they also take care of all the absentee voting, which is huge. If we had to take care of that here, we would need probably two or three more people to handle the absentee voting for an election. And so there's a lot that we do working together, um, our office with the county auditor's office. Yeah, I guess I don't mind paying for a service. I guess I wouldn't mind paying the county for performing this service. 
but I, I guess I'm not sure about, well, I guess maybe we could say we're, we're getting this machine and this is part of our payment for your service, or? Well, I tell you what, if we didn't purchase that, I bet they would say good luck on election night and we'd have to purchase one ourselves or two ourselves and a lot more equipment. Um, we'd end up spending a lot more money than if we purchase this one machine and let the county use it and help us on election night. But if I can just, the, the county auditor is responsible for counting ballots though, is or, No, they would not be obligated to count our ballots. That is an agreement that we have worked with them for years and years. Yep, so okay. they, they are under no obligation to do that. Okay, thank you. Councilor Karski. Thank you, Mayor. Earlier tonight we had a, during public input, um, gentlemen speak about collaboration and the need to collaborate between the county and the city. And mm -hmm. this is such a great example of what we can do to work together. Um, the county probably will use the machines more often than we sure. will, but we do need them and we do need to use them. And I just want to thank you for working with the county auditor to, to get this yeah. done. I, I think it's, it is our fair share. Mm -hmm. Councilor Bach. Thank you, Laura. I do appreciate your work on this, and, and it shows the level of geekitude among this group of how excited we are that, about this machine. Right. Um, a couple of things, though. Talk about the four machines. Geekitude, it is a word. You'd look it up. <laughs> there, talk about the four machines that exist now. How old are they? Okay. And remind us again yes. how many they do at a time. Yeah, those four machines are coming up on 10 years. In fact, we had talked with the county last uh, spring before our election that we would need to replace those. And we had already agreed um, through a memorandum of understanding to purchase one at 100,000 of, of the old model. So now we're just spending a little bit more and getting a top of the line brand new model. Um, so we have the four machines down there. Two are going to be traded in and two he will probably sell to another entity that can use them. But they, they've, they've lived their life. I mean, they've, they've been around for a long time. And this new one, the DS stands for digital scan. So I mean, it digitally reads. Um, even the printers, the, the old machines had these blue bar printers, which are, you know, just go line by line by line and print. And they've got the, the digital printers that just, you know, the printouts are, are done in just a heartbeat. Um, so in the electronic age, 10 years is a dinosaur. Very much so, yes. And, and we, know, um, we know well, based on our experience in April, what dinosaurs do in counting ballots. It was a exactly. horrible night. We for... had one machine that actually went down. We, we chose to use, or the county chose to use three of the four. One went down a little ways into the evening, and you know it was a long, long night counting those ballots. And I, I just think this will be great as far as the speed because it's 300 per minute versus 120. And also the fact that I just don't think we're going to have the problems at all with the, with the absentee or the ballots that get mailed in that are folded. And, and, you know, if you'd sat and watched that go through, I didn't think we were ever going to get done with those. It just went on and on and jammed and jammed one after the other. So if I yes, could, Councilor. One more, Mr. Mayor. Just then, um, guess on a life expectancy on these kind of machines. We're running two of them like this. We use them two times a year, basically, sometimes yeah. three times a year. Um, life we're, expectancy, four years? Well, maybe? actually, we're looking probably about 10 years. If, you know, they'll be well taken care of, maintained, um, service work done on them, you know, after each election or prior to each election. So um, we're looking, ho hoping for 10 years on these. Good, thank Elsewhere you. Elsewhere Buck, would you mind setting I, a I would love to set a day of hearing. hearing. I would make that motion. For thank Tuesday, you. October 14th. Thank you, Councilor Second. Buck. Karski. Thank you, Councilor Karski. A roll call vote, please. Council members Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Karski? Yes. Thank you. That's passed 7 to 0. Item 32. Item 32 is a first reading to set a date of hearing and second reading for Tuesday, October 14th, 2014 at 7 o'clock p.m. For an ordinance, ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the Code of Ordinances of the City by revising Chapter 124, Vehicles for Hire. Good evening, Jim Davids, City Council staff. The Vehicle for Hire Ordinance, which regulates buses, taxi cabs, limousines, and others, went through considerable revision by the Council in April of 2014. Some of the examples of the ordinance change include certified mechanic inspections, elimination of the fuel surcharge, consumer protections, business and driver background check enhancements, and others. Since the ordinance became effective August, October 1st, three additional changes are recommended in the proposed ordinance before you tonight. 
The first change involves repealing the required taxi meter inspection and seal. This summer, the city issued an RFP for inspection services, but received only one proposal for $90 per taxi meter inspection. Due to the higher than expected cost, the city council declined the inspection contract last month. Language allowing for random or complaint-based inspections will remain intact. The second change, correct, change corrects an error in how taxi fares are calculated. In 2007, the council passed two ordinances that increased fares in Sioux Falls. Unfortunately, the, the ordinance changed the initial mile fraction from one ninth to one tenth, but left the each succeeding fraction in place at <laughs> one ninth. To keep fares as revenue neutral as possible, this proposed ordinance reduces the fraction from one tenth to one ninth, but increases the drop charge from $2.60 to $2.95. There would be no change to the first and succeeding mile fare, but those traveling less than one mile would see a 35, 35 cent increase. The third and final change involves the state issued carrier license. This allows alcohol, excuse me, alcohol aboard a taxi, bus, limousine, or other vehicles for hire. Earlier this year, the legislature passed a law allowing local restrictions to this license. This proposed ordinance requires a driver server be 21 years of age. Alcohol may not be accessible to the driver while he is seated and security management plan would be required. Be happy to answer your questions. Council, first reading, any questions? Move to set the date of second reading for Tuesday, October 14th. Second, Anderson. It's been a motion to set a uh, date of hearing to discuss this further. Uh, on October 14th, it has been seconded. A roll call vote, please. Council members Kiley? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Karski? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0, item 33. Item, 30, item 33 is a first reading. Set a date of hearing and second reading for Tuesday, October 14th, 2014 at 7 o'clock p.m. 4. An ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the Code of Ordinances of the City by relocating the electricity provisions from public works and relocating to land usage Title 15, Chapter 150, Building of the Code of Ordinances of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and adopting Title 5 of Chapter 55, Electricity, the 2014 National Electrical Code, and amendments thereto. Mr. Bell, welcome. Good evening. Ron Bell, Building Services, um, Planning Building Services. What you have in front of you is a first reading for the adoption of the two, 2014 National Electrical Code. This is the most widely, well, it is the only electrical code that's used in the entire country. You can see on, on the sketch up there that all the red states are those states that have adopted the most up-to-date, most recent uh, National Electrical Code. Uh, this process started in January and February where there was statewide meetings, but here in Sioux Falls there was um, two meetings with the International Association of Electrical Inspectors and South Dakota Electrical uh, Council had meetings in uh, January or February and that dealt with the code changes and with approximately 280, 300 um, electrical, electricians, journeymen, apprentices and so forth. So that laid out what the, what the code changes were. And in July 1st, the State Electrical Commission actually adopted this code. So in effect, we're already under this code. Anything that's been issued um, since um, July 1st of, of 2014, um, based on the mandate with the state, is, is that everything is already being enforced with the 2014 National Electrical Code. What this ordinance really does, it, it was a lot of editorial because we took it, the, the previous electrical code ordinances was in the public works section of the codes and we simply took that out of public works and put it in chapter 150 where all, all the building codes will now be. We have one more to do and that's gonna be the plumbing code when we adopt that next year. Um, as far as actual changes to the ordinance, uh, we did make a change <laughs> that really reflected a policy change that we made in house. Uh, there, there was a prior, prior to a couple months ago, we required an electrical inspection and a mechanical inspection for every furnace and every air conditioner change out. And that got to be a nightmare of coordinating two different inspectors with homeowners and so forth. And we finally convinced the electrical inspectors it's time to allow the mechanical inspectors who are the primary inspection for those appliances to let them do their mechanical uh, code inspections, but also look at the electrical. 
And what's happening is that they're looking at the electrical systems. If they ever see something that would be out of, out of ordinance, we would then turn that over to the electrical inspectors. So we're eliminating um, hundreds and hundreds of inspections that our electrical inspectors are doing. So this ordinance will reflect that. You'll also see um, significant changes um, in, in the rest of the synopsis and submittal. And, and those are the things that are in effect. Those are the things that were discussed with the electrical contractors and journeymen and apprentices. And that's what we're really enforcing right now. So we're real, what we're really doing here is we're, for second reading, is simply catching us up yep. by ordinance with the city ordinance consistent with what the State Electrical Commission has already done. Very, very good, Ron. Thank you. Councilor Stegers. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that we're going to have fewer inspections and having the mechanical <clears throat> inspections take care of this. But are there additional uh, regulations that, that add costs or not? Well, I would say that there are, there are regulations that, that um, increase costs, but I guess you have to weigh the cost based on what the life safety is that, that is in the codes from the national consensus standards. Right, and, and how do we know, you know, cost benefits? Because the people that are uh, presenting these codes, it's to their benefit to have these codes. What people? Electrical. They come up with the codes, don't they? This is a national consensus standard that's put out by the, by the National Fire Protection Association. This, these codes are debated on national levels. Uh -huh, with and you, you will people. also see that there was 3,745 code proposals that were debated at the national level. Uh -huh. Yes, cost, cost is a factor, but life safety is as much of a factor as what these codes are trying to So do we include. know what the cost is, the additional cost? I cannot tell you, I can't quantify that. Mm -hmm. Move to set the hearing. Thank you. Second, Karski. There's been a motion to set a date of hearing and second reading for Tuesday, October 14th for this item. Uh, thank you, Councilor Bach. Thank you, Councilor um, uh, Karski. A roll call vote, please. Council Members Kiley? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Karski? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0, item 34. Item 34 is a first reading to set a data hearing and second reading for Tuesday, October 14th, 2014 at 7 o'clock p.m. for an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, approving a water tank lease agreements, Western Heights. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council. Trent Lewis with the Office of Public Works. Um, my comments are really going to be uh, repeated on items 34, 35, and 36. They uh, represent three separate lease agreements for the three separate elevated water storage towers that we have in the city. As you can imagine, as high spots in the city, they're very valuable to communication companies uh, for their communications equipment uh, so that they don't put up extra towers. We've made that space available to these companies. Um, this work has been performed to modify this lease by our water program coordinator, Darren Fries, who's here tonight, and Diane Best uh, uh, with the city attorney's office. And this really represents a wholesale change to the way that we've done leases in the past. Before, we've used a second party uh, company to manage our, our, our leases with water tower agreements and communication companies, and we split that revenue. And now uh, we've managed that uh, internally with the water program coordinator position, and we get all the revenue for the city of Sioux Falls. Uh, the other change for this lease agreement is we would do an annual lease, or we would come to you year to year to year for a lease. And this is really a, a five-year lease with three five-year renewal options. And we also have an escalator for the uh, lease amount built into these leases. So every five years, it would escalate by 10%. So we'll be having more of these coming forward as we work through these lease agreements. Uh, but this has really been a, a good change. Uh, the feedback from the communication companies is that uh, the level of communication and the level of service that they're getting from the city of Sioux Falls managing these themselves has uh, greatly increased. And it's been a good wholesale change for them. So uh, we uh, uh, encourage your uh, uh, support for a second reading. Thank, Thank you. Trent. Yes, Councilor Karski. Question on this. Who exercises the option to renew the lease, and does that come back before the council at that time as a new contract? Uh, no, the, the option is if you, uh, if you, uh, if you approve uh, the lease, then uh, there's a mutually, uh, both parties can exercise the option with notice. So we have the ability with uh, six months' notice to terminate at a renewal time, and they have the option to terminate with uh, three months' notice to terminate. Okay. And then it would come back as a new contract at that point to the council. If, if there would be a new contract or contract terms would change, we would bring back a, a new contract. Thank you. 
or we would find another tenant for the space that they vacate and we would bring a new contract for that space. Councilor Stangers? Yes. Um, <coughs> are you going to be having the Menlo Park Tower pretty soon or not? I'm sorry? Menlo are, Park Tower? To do The water tower, to yeah. Do, to do maintenance on it or to... Uh, to do the... To do the uh, yeah, the different uh, antennas are on top of that. Yeah, there's uh, th that's one of the um, uh, one of the sites. I think it's item 35 is in this uh, uh, package also. Oh, okay, okay. It, it says Melanie Tower. Melanie. Um, for for 35, I. I I guess I didn't see Menlo Park. I'm not. sure. Councillor uh, Councillor Staggers, I'm not sure what tower you're talking about at Menlo Park. Well, there's only one water tower at Menlo Park with antennas on top of it, yeah. and it's Sanford. That's the that's the Melanie tank. Sorry, it's our. That's the Melanie tank. It's not Melanie. I'm sorry. It is. Uh, you're right. It's at the Sanford complex, and that's uh, that's not in this, Darren. Okay, that, uh, there is no, uh, this company did not need it for their network, uh, but we do have communication uh, equipment on uh, that site. Sorry, I was confused. We have four elevated storage tanks, and there's three. <laughs> now, I guess I'm here, not so sure. That... Uh, so the Menlo Park water tower, it, it, is it part of 35, number 35? Uh, Trent, I, I guess I'm confused. Trent, Councilor Stegers yeah. had asked, is there a, uh, first of all, is, is there a w tower in Menlo Park? The answer to that is yes. yes. Is there, there an is. antenna on the tower at Menlo Park? The answer to that is yes. 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 There are several. But, but that, par that antenna, that park, that water tower is not included in 34, 35, or 36. I don't believe so, no. Yes. And I got a thumbs up from the gentleman in the back of the room. Thank you, Mayor. So, <laughs> so Councilor Staggers, that'll come at another time. It's going to come at another time, time then. Yes. Huh? Okay. I'm interested in that tower, so. Obviously. Okay. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Move to set the hearing for item 34. Second. There's been a motion to set a date of hearing, second reading for Tuesday, October 14th by Councilor Bach. Thank you. Second by Councilor Anderson, Jr. Uh, a roll call vote, please. Council members Kiley? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Karski? Yes. That is passed 7 0, item 35. Item 35 is a first reading to set a date of hearing and second reading for Tuesday, October 14th, 2014, at 7 o'clock p.m. for an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, approving a water tank lease agreement, Melanie Tower. Would anybody want to set a date of hearing? So moved. Second. Thank, thank you both, Councilor Anderson, Jr., and Councilor Rolfing. Uh, for Tuesday, October 14th, a roll call vote, please. Council members Kiley? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Karski? Yes. Thank you. That's passed 7 to 0. Item 36. Item 36 is a first reading set of data hearing and second reading for Tuesday, October 14th, 2014, at 7 o'clock p.m. for an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, approving a water tank lease agreement, 57th Street Water Tower. Council, would anybody want to set a data, he data oh, hearing and second Anderson. reading? Thank you, Councilor Anderson. Second, Kiley. Thank you, Councilor Kiley. A roll call vote, please. Council members Kiley? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Karski? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0. Thank you. Item 37. Item 37 is a resolution of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, approving the naming of a facility space on public property. Good Welcome. evening, Mayor, Good evening. City Council members. I'm Elizabeth Whaley. I'm the President and CEO of the Great Plains Zoo. And it's really nice to be here with you tonight to talk about our new education center. We've worked very hard across the last few years to design a beautiful space for a brand new education center. Um, and of course, beautiful spaces are great to have, but this really was born out of a huge need. We had grown our educational programs. We had outgrown the spaces that we had for kids to come to zoo camps and classes. And so with the project that we just completed at the very front of the zoo, renovating the whole front of the zoo, we included a new educational space. And already we're seeing more programming out of that space and more and more kids being able to take part in our programs. Um, we're really excited because right now we're teaching about 46,000 kids in unique educational settings from Zoomobiles that go throughout the four-state area 
to on-site classes and camps, including zoo snoozes, where you get to come overnight at the zoo and have a little flashlight tour and have a little snack and a movie, and it's all sorts of fun. And of course, all of these are incredibly important because now we're seeing actual studies on what's called nature deficit disorder, meaning kids are spending so much time in front of screens uh, and, and so little time outside connecting with nature, connecting with animals, that they actually are less empathetic than they should be. Uh, they're having more physical problems, including asthma and allergies and others. Um, but really, it's creating a difference in our society and the kinds of people that they're going to become. And zoos need to take an active role in that kind of education. So we're really excited about what we're able to do. And our new education center, if you haven't been out there, I would invite you to come out. We're still working on it. Uh, but it has a brand new reading tree where we'll give free reading sessions on the weekends and include animal encounters. Uh, we're now in the current century, decade, on technology. Uh, and we're now part of the DDN network, so we have screens where we can include virtual field trips, really for schools across the state, um, but really enhance those on-site educational programs for kids from, believe it or not, age 15 months all the way up through high school. Uh, so in addition to those virtual field trips and classes and content that's based on natural history of animals, we also can connect kids right here in Sioux Falls into experiences they would never be able to have at the zoo. For example, with very large animals, with very dangerous animals, because we'll have video technology behind the scenes. So they can come out and see the tiger tooth extraction which of course we'd never allow them to do right in our veterinary hospital. Um, we have a unique and wonderful opportunity through one of our sponsors to uh, get additional funding for this center and to provide a naming opportunity for this. And so in front of us is an offer from Kelloland to provide $200,000 across five years in the form of airtime, web, and equipment to support what they would like to be known as the Kelloland Education Center. We feel that this is an awfully good deal for the zoo and for our community, and it's just one piece of funding that is joining funding from others to make this really a lush space. So in addition to that technology and the screens and the reading tree, we also will have lots and lots of very cool, hands-on, up-close animal installations, including a really fun exhibit with hornbills at the top and mongoose at the bottom and a little bubble into the classroom where the mongoose can scurry over and the kids can be nose to nose with these amazing animals. So we really feel that this is at the heart of our mission and we hope that you will approve uh, the naming of the Kelloland Education Center. And of course, Mike Cooper and our partners at the city have already moved this through the zoo board, the parks board, the naming committee the marketing committee of the parks board, not necessarily in that order. And so now we come to you as the final approval for what we think is really a move forward for our zoo. Councilor Erickson. I think this is a great deal. I have little kids and to be able to promote our zoo and get people excited about it and able to come, um, I think this is a great idea. So I'd move approval. Thank you. Second, Karski. It's been a motion to approve this item. It's been seconded by Councilor Karski, Councilor Mbach. I also have um, little kids of different ages in my, in my life, and we were out just the other day. And my question is, for visual, where exactly, what did this space used to be so that I can get a visual on where I would encounter this education opportunity? Come right on in through the new transparent gateway. Take a right, go to where the old gift shop was. So with the renovation of the museum, uh, the very front of the museum, we've done a couple of good things. We've moved the gift shop up front onto the plaza because as Disney and everybody else knows, really that little memorabilia piece is part of the experience. It also helps float the boat at the zoo from a revenue standpoint. So we wanted that revenue right front and center, give that opportunity to all of our families uh, and attendees so that they can help support the zoo. But also it opened up that larger area so that we could have a really beautiful classroom by moving the retail shop up front. Uh, and then also include some education spaces for our teachers so they actually had offices. Um, 
most of them have cubicles, but they're a little bit more private than what we used to have. So lots of functionality built into that build out um, and certainly a beautiful education space for people to come into. We also believe that in addition to driving additional education programming and additional people into our education programs, we think just with the constant promotion, we'll see more visitors. And we're very pleased to tell you that um, as of this moment in the year, we're 11.8% ahead of last year on attendance. And um, if that keeps pace, we will be well more than double our attendance of just seven years ago. So um, we know that we can teach a lot more kids with the support of that promotion. Councilor Stangers. Yeah, just to clarify, uh, Kello Land's gonna, or Kello is gonna provide $40,000 per year. Is that exclusively in-kind advertising or is there some dollars involved? Let me break it out for you. Okay. Um, it'll be $20,000 a year in general advertising, meaning what we currently spend on promoting a visit to the zoo in lots of different ways, they are open to whatever we want to use that for. Okay. They're also going to support $14,000 a year specific to our educational programs. So we can create that steady drumbeat of, you know, come meet Reggie the Hedgehog during our free reading hours or whatever other educational events we have going on. And so we think that will really get more people involved in our zoo camps, zoo classes, um, which are fee for service and some of them are free. So it's a good deal for our families to really get to know about what's going on at the zoo. Um, 5,000 of that per year is in promotions that are special promotions with Kello. And so those will be um, more specific marketing partnership type promotions that also I think will be very high visibility. And then 5,000 of that is in equipment. And that's already in place at the zoo. They've already gifted that to the zoo. Okay, thank you. There has been a motion and has been seconded. Uh, roll call, please. Council members Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Karski? Yes. That's passed seven to zero. Thank you. Item 38. Thank you I all. Item 38 is a report of the September 30th, 2014 Notice of Transfer of Appropriations within Major Organizational Units. Thank you. Thank you. Council, if there's no new business, I did want to recognize, it uh, looks like we've got some new students from the University of Sioux Falls. Is that correct? <laughs> Augie as well, or just USF? Just USF, and they've got a big game uh, on Saturday versus their arch nemesis across the street. Go Augie. Uh, very good, oh. very good. I want to welcome you to uh, the city council meeting, and thank you very much for learning uh, along with us tonight. Thank you. Uh, council, a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Thank you. There's been a motion to adjourn this meeting, seconded by uh, Council Rolfing. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? This meeting is adjourned to Falls. Thank you and make it a great, great night. <laughs>